Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. As I said to you guys coming into this new year, that I was going to teach on the fruits of the Spirit. Okay? Now, you might, oh no, I'm going to have a boring series on the fruits of the Spirit, on, on love and joy and peace. Hey, look, you know what? Some preaching, yeah, you know, it's exciting. Some preaching is, you know, ad, you, know you follow Jesus on his adventures and you see how he, how he, he uh, you know, speaks against the hypocrites and the Pharisees and that's all exciting. But you know what excites the Spirit? What excites the Holy Spirit? What excites that new revived Spirit, the new man in you, is the fruits of the Spirit. You know what's exciting for you? When you go out and you knock doors and you, win souls, you see souls saved, now, don't tell me that's not exciting. Okay, it's exciting when you go and see souls saved because that's the fruit of the righteous. That's your fruit. You can see that with your hard work, with your growth, you've been able to see souls saved. Praise God. How much does that then excite the Spirit when the Spirit sees the fruit of the Spirit developing in you? Okay? So, you know, as we go through this series on the fruits of the Spirit, hey, it might not appeal to your flesh, but I don't want to appeal to your flesh. Okay, it's definitely going to appeal to your spirit. It's going to appeal to that new man. And if we want to be Christians in 2019, all right, that are maturing, that are growing, that are walking in the spirit, how are we going to test that in our lives? You know, because here's the thing. Like I said before, you guys in 2019, there's going to be times you're walking in the spirit. There's going to be other times you're walking after the flesh when you sin and, and, you, and you seek the things of, of this world. But what we want to do is change the ratio. We want to spend more time walking in the Spirit, which will reduce the time you walk in the flesh, which will reduce the amount of sin that you commit in your life, okay? And you'll be in, in, in more constant fellowship with God. That's what's going to strengthen you. That's what's, that's what's going to grow you, mature you as a believer. You don't need to turn there, but I'll just read from Matthew 22, verse 36. It says, Master, which is the great commandment in the, in, in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. The title of the sermon tonight is Thou Shalt Love. Okay, the first fruit of the Spirit that we're going to be looking at is the first one that's in the list there in Galatians 5, which is love. Okay, thou shalt love the fruits of the Spirit, part one. Now, Jesus Christ has taught us that we ought to love many different people, okay, in the Bible. We already saw there from what I read that we are to love the Lord God, but we also are to love our neighbors, okay? Say, well, who's our neighbor? Hey, that's a question that was brought forth to Jesus Christ at one point in time. Okay, so we're going to start off by looking at loving your neighbor. Loving your neighbor. Who is your neighbor? You know, and here's the thing, guys. The only way you can love the way God wants you to love is if you're walking in the Spirit. You can't expect the fruits of the Spirit to just develop in your life if you're seeking after the flesh. You need to be able to spend time in the Spirit, spend time in the Word of God, in church, praying to the Lord, doing everything that you need to do, being in communion with the Lord, walking in fellowship, serving the Lord all the days of your life. Okay, and, and through that process, you will learn to love. Through that process, all these fruits of the Spirit will develop in your life. Okay, you know, are you someone that's, you know, when I look at your life, when you look at yourself, when you do your self-examination, are you someone that's known for their love? Or are you someone that's known for their hatred? You say, well, a bit of both. Well, praise God for a bit of both, okay? But here's the thing. We've got to be careful because, you know, there is a, a, a wrong type of hatred, okay? But there's also a righteous type of hatred, which we'll get into later on, okay? But we see hatred is not one of the fruits of the Spirit, but it's love. You know, we ought to be people that, that when people look at us, they say, hey, these are a people that love. These are people that love their neighbor, that love their brethren, that love the Lord God. Can you guys turn to Romans chapter 13, please? Romans 13, verse 8. Romans 13, verse 8. Because I, I have heard it, 
not by many, it seems to be more of a fringe teaching, that loving your neighbor means loving your brethren, like loving your your saved brethren. And of course, there's an element to that, okay? Of course, loving the brethren would fall under loving your neighbor, okay? But is it just your saved brethren that you ought to show love toward? Look at Romans 13, verse 8. The Bible says, Owe no man anything but to love one another. Hey, there's something we owe man, okay? That we ought to love one another, okay? That's a deep and profound truth. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law, okay? Verse 9, for this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. If there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. What did we just read this? Some of the thou shalt not. Where's that coming from? The Ten Commandments, right? The Ten Commandments that deal with our relationship with our fellow man, with, 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 with other, you know, other people. Okay, And basically, what, what's been taught here, the same thing that Jesus Christ taught, if we just love our neighbor, we keep it simple, we just show love, then we'll be keeping all those other commandments. Okay, Because it's when you break those commandments, then you're not showing love toward your neighbor, to, to your fellow man. All right. Now let's think about this in verse number 9. Is loving your neighbor just your loving your, your brethren, your saved brethren? Well, think about it. All right? The commands were, thou shalt not kill. Well, if you're, if you're applying it to just say brethren, well, then I, I shouldn't kill my saved brethren. <laughs> but I can kill those that are unsaved. All right? I mean, think about it. Think about it like that, right? And then, you know, thou shalt not steal. Well, I can't steal from my saved brethren. But then I guess it's okay to steal from, you know, the unsaved, the non-believing world. Now, of course, these commandments are not just to the saved brethren. They're to all mankind. Okay? We shouldn't be killing anyone or, you know, um, committing murder or, or stealing or bearing false witness or committing adultery or coveting the possessions of any man, your brethren and the unsaved world, the unsaved people, okay? So we see immediately if we're to love our neighbor, these are commands that God gave us to deal with, to fellowship with, with every man, okay? With every man, all right? It also said there in verse number 10, in uh, Romans 13 verse 10, Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. All right? So they say, well, what's the population of the world? Is it, it's 7 billion now, I think, right? I think we're approaching 8 billion, okay? Are you telling me, Pastor Kev, that we are to love all 8 billion people in this world? Is that what you're asking of me? No, no, the Bible says love your neighbor. Uh, you're not going to cross paths with 8 billion people in your life. You're going to cross paths with a small percentage of that throughout your whole life, okay? And the people you, you deal with on a constant basis, you know, yeah, your, your neighborhood, you know, the people that live, your, your next door neighbors and people like that, the people you work with, you know, obviously the people you go to church with, the people that you meet in different parts, you know, in, in, in just, just conducting your business, going to the shops, just interacting with whoever it is that you interact with, that's your neighbor, okay? We're asked to keep the commands that, you know, to all mankind, these are your neighbors, and that question did get asked, if you guys can turn to Luke chapter 10, I know I already preached on this not long ago, but we need to touch upon it very quickly. Luke 10, 27. Luke 27. Luke 10, 27, sorry. Luke 10, 27. Luke 10, 27. And he answer, answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? You know, this uh, lawyer, I believe it was, uh, was trying to, you know, work out who's my neighbor. Because, you know, he wants to justify himself. You know, obviously he's not been keeping this command. He's not been loving the people that he comes across. Maybe he's been loving a certain percentage. Maybe he's been loving the people that he, that he goes to church with, or not church back then, but, you know, to the temple, his fellow lawyers, his fellow Pharisees, or whatever. He's trying to justify himself. He's trying to narrow it a little bit. You know, and he asks the question, who is my neighbor? Verse 30, And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him. 
and departed, leaving him half dead. Now look, if you're walking along your path, on your footpath, and you come across someone who's still alive, even if he was dead, all right, I think, I, I believe any of you guys would stop and go, what in the world? What can I do? All right, and you, the, probably the least you would do is get your phone and ring the ambulance, all right? Ring, ring triple zero. Oh, is it triple zero here? Would be, right? Anyway, you know, I'm, I'm sure you would do that, right? But here's what happens with this guy, and he's not even dead, he's, he's half dead. Verse 31, and by chance they came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Okay, and likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, hey, someone that's not even the same, of the same people as the Jews, okay, someone that is from another land, another part, you know, and again, those enmity between the, the, uh, the, the Jews and the Samaritans, but a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. Hey, do you have compassion for your fellow man? Your fellow man who's in need. You know, if, if you're just, uh, you, you know, you might see an elderly man whose car has broken down. Do you have compassion on that person? And you think, hey, maybe I can stop and help this person. Maybe I can help stop and change their tire or whatever. Or call roadside assistance for their, you know, who knows? You know, do you have compassion the way the Samaritan did here? Verse 34. And he went to him and bound up his wounds pouring in oil and wine and set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, take care of him and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? I mean, easy question. And he said, he that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, Go and do thou likewise. Hey, the instruction that God gives us to love our neighbors is to go and do thou likewise. You know, we ought to be people that have compassion even on the unsaved world. Okay? If, if your neighbor has a need and you're able to fulfill that need, you ought to be generous. Even if it's going to cost you a little bit of money, like it cost the Good Samaritan to look after this fallen person, hey, we need to be generous in that way. We need to show kindness. All right? And say, well, they're, they're non believing. What, what if they're reprobate? What if they're all this? You know? We'll cover that in a minute. All right? But, you know, when, when we come across people in our lives, they ought to say, hey, this person is, is, is of, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, this person's a. A good man. This person's a good woman. This person shows generosity. This person shows love to the people they come across. You know, when I, if we go to the shop, I always greet the, the check-in, the, the checkout person, all right? They're important, the people we come across. We don't know what opportunities might be given to us in the future to give that person the gospel. We don't know what kind of opportunities might open up just to have a bit of a smile, to say hello, to say goodbye, to say thank you, to say please. You know, to show some love and respect to your, to your common man. Can you guys go back to Galatians 5? Galatians 5, verse 19. But are we to love everybody? Is everybody our neighbor? And those are the questions that come up. Galatians 5, verse 19. Let's look at this quickly. Galatians 5, 19. Before we, got, before we looked at the passage of the fruits of the Spirit... God gave us a list of the works of the flesh in comparison. Look at it, verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred. What's the opposite of love? It's hate, all right? Hatred is here listed amongst the works of the flesh. Variance, emulations, wrath, Strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And before you start panicking, I've done those things. Am I not going into the kingdom of God? Those are the works of the flesh. We've all done some of those things on that list. 
Okay? And this flesh, this flesh and blood will not inherit the kingdom of God. Once again, that's why we must be born again of the Spirit. Then we can enter the kingdom of God. But, you know, I just want to show you the comparison there. Hatred is listed as a work of the flesh, and love is listed as the fruits of the Spirit. Okay? So, you know, is hate then a work of the flesh? Yes, it is. It is, according to that list. But not all hate is the work of the flesh. All right, so let's not confuse those things, okay? The reason I say that is, I'll just read to you from Psalm 5.5. 5. It says, The foolish shall not stand in thy sight, in the sight of God. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. We already covered that before we went through Psalms, right? That God actually hates not just the iniquity, but God can hate the workers of iniquity. So if, if hate is listed as a work of the flesh, are we saying then the hatred that God has here is the work of the flesh? Of course not, because God does not have a fallen, sin, a sinful nature like we do. Okay, But he can hate with a righteous hatred. Verse number 6 says, Thou shalt destroy them that speak leasing, and, and the Lord will abhor the bloody and deceitful man. God hates those that, that go about and murder. Okay, God hates the serial killers, those that love the shedding of blood. You know, he abhors them, which is a stronger version of hate. Are we going to then say, well, hold on God, that's a work of the flesh and you're not supposed to hate. No, there is a righteous hatred. And as we'll soon see, you cannot love without hating something. Okay? I mean, these two things have to go, go together. All right? Turn to Psalm uh, 97, please. Psalm 97, verse 10. Psalm 97, verse 10. We can't talk about love without first talking a little bit about hatred and the righteous hatred that we see in the Bible. Because we don't want to eliminate hatred altogether. Otherwise, you'll become an unbalanced Christian. Okay? Psalm 97, verse 10. Psalm 97, verse 10. Ye that love the Lord. Hey, do you guys love the Lord? Do you want to love the Lord? Yes, it's, it's a fruit of the Spirit. We want to love the Lord more, right? So how do we do it? What's the instruction? Ye that love the Lord, hate Evil. Hey, we need to be people that hate the evil in this world. The workers of iniquity. And if you hate that thing, which is a righteous hatred, we say we know that God hates it. That will show that you actually love God. You love his commands. You love his holiness. You love his, his way. Okay? Instead of the way of the world. It says, ye that love the Lord hate evil. Okay? He preserves the souls of his saints. He delivereth them out of the hand. Of the wicked. Turn to Psalm 139. Psalm 139, verse 19. Psalm 139, verse 19. A Psalm of David. A man after God's own heart. A man who loved the Lord God. He's got that title. What an amazing title. What a privilege to be known as a man after God's own heart. And what does he say in Psalm 139, verse 19? He says, Surely thou wilt slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, ye bloody men, for they speak against thee wickedly, and thine enemies take thy name in vain. So these are haters of God. These are that, that, those that speak wickedly of God, he says in 20, verse 21. Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? Am I not grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. Hey, there is a perfect hatred. There is a righteous hatred. A hatred that comes from God, from knowing His Word, knowing what He loves, knowing what He hates, and it's right to hate the things that God hates. In fact, if you do that, you show that you love God. All right? These things come together. A perfect hatred for the wicked, all right? Especially for wickedness and the wicked and, and like reprobates, all those kinds of people. That, uh, that hate the Lord God, that hate Him, okay? It is right for us to count them as our enemies, okay? Because they're first the enemies of God, all right? We know we ought to love our enemies, all right? You might do something wrong to me and I get a bit angry at you. You know, I might count you as my enemy for a little while, but I'm, I'm still commanded to love you, okay? But there are people out there that actually hate God. They despise and they speak wickedly of Him. We're not to love those people, okay? Now, we need to be careful that the, the perfect hatred that we know of in the Bible does not, you know, um, spill over into the flesh. 
okay? Because we know the flesh also likes to hate, all right? So we need to be careful. And I like what David says in verse 23, because he realizes that he's got to be careful, right? He says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. So this is straight after he just says, I hate those that hate, you know, uh, thee. But then he says, you know, search me. You know, he wants to make sure that his hatred is righteous, that it's, it's holy, that it's perfect, and that it's not, you know, coming from his flesh. It's not coming from his own wickedness that he has, okay? So we see even David has to have a self-examination, all right? We shouldn't be people that just are always, you know, always seeking to hate, you know, always doing that. No, we should be people that are striving to love, right? We should be, you know, the same. We should be seeing people as innocent till proven guilty. And if they're proven guilty to be a hater of God, then yes, now you can express your hatred toward that person. All right? But start with the love first. All right? You don't want to accidentally hate those that, you know, uh, God has commanded us to love. All right? Let's keep going. Let's turn to uh, John chapter 13. John 13 verse 34. Talk about loving your neighbors originally, right? Loving your neighbors. Okay, please demonstrate love to the people you come across. Okay, just being courteous, just being kind, you know, will show love toward your neighbors. If there's a neighbor in need, go and help them. You don't have to check with God, is this my brethren? What if they're a reprobate? <laughs> you go and help them anyway, right? Innocent till proven guilty. All right, you don't know. I mean, look, you knock doors sometimes. The best love you can show to your neighbor is preaching the gospel, going door to door. That's the best way of showing love, okay? You ignore that, and you're showing hatred to your neighbors. But hey, sometimes you knock the door, you might have some doubts, you might be, is this a reprobate? You know, is this a homosexual? Is this someone, look, I don't know. You know, sometimes I think about it, but I don't know. I'm gonna give them the benefit of the doubt and give them the gospel, all right? Let's keep going. John 13, 34. <clears throat> Jesus says, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Hey, this is a love for your brethren, love for your saved brothers, love for your saved sisters in the Lord. God commands us, a new commandment he gives us, that we are to love one another as I have loved you. How much has Christ loved you? How much? With his life, okay? He, he died for you. He took the eternal punishment that you would have to take. He stepped in. He did it out of love, okay, for you. And he says, out of that same love, we ought to love the brethren. Can you say that to me? Like, you, look, look, you don't have to look around the church. But can you say to me that every person in this church, I love them as much as Christ loves me? All right? And if you say, I can't honestly say that, well, you need to work on that fruit, okay? You need to ask the Holy Spirit to develop that fruit of love in you because that's a hallmark of being a true disciple of Jesus Christ, okay? People can see that you have a love for the brethren, a love for his disciples. That's going to show them that you are a disciple of Christ, that you are a follower of Christ, that you're seeking to follow after his commandments. Please turn to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. First Peter chapter 3, verse 8. Is Jesus asking too much from us? I don't think so. I don't think so. You know, if you think he's asking too much, then you've, you've just forgotten how much Christ loves you. You've just forgotten how much he sacrificed for you. Okay, and when you, when, you, when you can just stop and consider that, then you realize, I better love my brethren, all right, if that's been commanded of him. First Peter chapter 3, verse 8. It says, finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrawise, blessing, knowing that ye are, called, are, there, are there unto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. Hey, God wants to give us the inheritance of a blessing, but first we have to com have compassion for the brethren. We have to show pity and, and be courteous to the brethren. Hey, if the brethren do evil to us, we're not to render evil for evil or railing for railing. Okay? We are to show love one for another. You say, well, 
you know, I don't get along with brother so-and-so. I don't get along with sister so-and-so. Look, it, the command is not get along with brother so-and-so. The command is to love them. All right? It's possible to not necessarily get along, maybe not having the same interests, you know, just not having, you know, personality clashes or whatever, but you can still show courtesy. You can still show, you know, uh, have pity on that person if they're struggling with something. You can still show love, just greeting that person. You know, if you just ignore that person, you say, I don't get along with them, I'm just going to ignore them. Well, that's not showing love. That's you disobeying Jesus Christ. He says here in, the, in, the, in, his, in his words that we're to have uh, compassion, to be courteous to one another. You know what courteous is? That's saying hello to one another. Okay, that's saying bye to each other. Not ignoring one another, you know? I don't get along with everybody, but I try my best to be courteous, to be kind, to ask, hey, is there anything I can pray about? Is there anything that you need that I can help you with? We ought to be people like that, all right? Be careful. You know, we're commanded to love the brethren. You're in First Peter. Turn to First Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1, verse 22. First Peter chapter 1, verse 22. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. What's unfeigned? It means it's not fake. All right? <laughs> it's not fake. I've seen a lot of fake love in churches. All right? Our love for one another must be unfeigned. Unfeigned love for the brethren. See that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. Fervently. You know what that means? With, you know, passionate. Being passionate with how much you love them. Okay? We, we, we give it everything you've got. You know, it's, it's, it's similar to like a, like a fire burning fervently. Okay? That's how we ought to love the brethren. You know, I have to love you so much that it, it, just, it just comes out of a pure heart for the brethren. You know, we might not be the best friends. We might not get along in everything. But I can tell you something. I love you. All right? I love you. You know, and the reason why I wanted to be a pastor, because I knew there were brethren up here on the Sunshine Coast that needed a church. I was comfortable in Sydney. But I had a love for the brethren to do this. All right? I don't come up here to make a name for myself. I'm not here to earn brownie points with man. You know, the whole purpose of coming here and having a church was to show you some love. All right, to start a church, we all wanted it. We all wanted it to happen. I knew a lot of you guys were struggling in the churches you were at. Hey, you know, that's a love. You know, I, I hope I have a fervent love and an unfeigned love for you, you know? It's something that I need to keep testing, asking God to examine that in my heart, you know? Making sure I'm not just doing it to be seen of men. I'm not interested in that. I'll pull down all my sermons on YouTube if that proves that I love the church, that I love the brethren. I don't care about YouTube. All right? Let's keep going. Let's go to Mark 12. Mark 12. So we're commanded to love the, our neighbors. We're commanded to love the brethren. And I just, I'm, I'm almost done now. Well, I'm on my last point. That's to love the Lord thy God. To love the Lord thy God. Mark 12, verse 28. Mark 12, 28. And one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? So it's like, what's the, what's the primary commandment? Is what he's asking. And Jesus answering, answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. Okay? So that's in, uh, that's Mark 12, 28. I'll, I'll cover that later on. All right, so I just want to talk about very quickly these four points that Jesus Christ tells us that we ought to love him with, right? All thy heart, thy soul, thy mind, and all thy strength. So we need to look at this. You might say, I love him with all my heart, but do you love him with all your strength? You might say, I love him with all my soul, but do you love him with all your mind? Okay, these are four areas of our life that we need to love him with. Okay, let's um, please turn to Romans 6. I'll get you to turn there. Romans 6.15. Romans 
I've got a lot of verses. I'm just trying to figure out which ones for you to turn to. You go to Romans 6.15. How can we love God with all our heart? Now, each one of these points could be its own sermon, but I'll get through them pretty quickly. How can we love God with all our heart? Romans 6.15. What then? Shall we sin? Because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey... His servants, ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form, that, uh, that form of doctrine which was delivered you. You know, one way that we can love God with our heart is to obey the Lord, to obey His commandments. Okay, that's how we can love him with all our heart. In fact, Jesus says in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. You want to know if you love God with all your heart? Are you keeping his commandments? You know, how well are you keeping his commandments? That's a good way for you to judge how much you love the Lord Jesus Christ. If you keep breaking them and you don't have a care in the world about breaking it and committing sin, then that's how much you love Jesus Christ. Okay? It shows you how much you're lacking if you have no care in the sins that you're committing. But we are to love him by obeying, okay? By, by um, obeying his commandments. But when we obey, just like children, sometimes we ask our children to obey what we've asked them and they might have a sour face, you know? They might, be, uh, you know, hold a grudge, you know? They'll do it, but they'll do it, you know, you know, holding, you know, holding that against you or something like that, you know? Um, you know, being reluctant to obey. When we, when we obey His commandments and love Him with our heart, we need to do it with all our hearts, okay? We need to make sure we're not doing it reluctantly, not grudgingly. We're doing it with purpose. We're doing it because we're committed to Him. We're doing it with the strength that we have in our hearts. I'll just read to you Ephesians 6, 5. It says, Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in singleness of your heart, as unto Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Okay? It is possible for us to obey His commands, but not to do it from the heart. Right? It's possible for us to go out door knocking and do it in our own strength, in our own flesh. Okay? Just because it's something we need to do. No. Everything we need to do. So, you know, as, as a servant, just serving the master, we ought to be doing it as we're serving Christ and doing it from our hearts, obeying the will of God from our hearts. Another passage that's very similar is Colossians 3.22, basically a parallel passage. It says, Servants, obeying all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartedly. Okay? Do it passionately. Do it strongly as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. How do we love Christ with all our hearts? How do we love God with all our hearts? Is to obey His commandments and to do it heartedly. Okay? Do it with purpose. Okay? Whatever God has asked us to do, do it as though we're serving Him. Please go to Psalm 146. Psalm 146. How can we love God with all our soul? All right, with all our soul. You know, Christ came and he, He's delivered our soul from hell. Our soul has been saved. And, and the, and the, and the uh, book of the Bible that speaks the most about the human soul is the book of Psalms. So I think it's a good place to turn to. How do we love Him with our soul? Psalm 146, 146 verse 1. It says, Praise ye the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. How can we love God with all our soul? It's by praising Him, by singing praises unto the Lord, by rejoicing in Him. All right? Psalm 34, please, verse 2. Psalm, Psalm 34, verse 2. Psalm 34, verse 2. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. 
What did it say? My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. Hey, we ought to be people that boast, not in our flesh, not in our, 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 our strengths, but to boast in the Lord. And how do we do that? It says the humble shall hear thereof. You know, when we talk to our, to our brethren, when we talk to people, we ought to talk about how God has done great things in our life, how He has blessed us, how He has saved us. You know, share how God has changed your life and has worked in you and developed that new man, that spirit has helped you walk in the spirit. You know, that's boasting of the Lord, not of yourselves. You know, it's talking about how what God has done. Why is that important? Because it said, the humble shall hear thereof and be glad. All right? We can, make, we, can actually, we can make other people glad by boasting of the Lord, by speaking highly of Him. Okay? Psalm 35, verse 9. Psalm 35, next chapter, Psalm over. 35, verse 9. And my soul shall be joyful in the Lord. It shall rejoice in His salvation. The third way we can, we can love the Lord of our soul is to rejoice in the Lord, and especially in our salvation. Okay, and that's why, you know, we haven't done it for a while, but I've had you guys come up here and give a testimony of your salvation. When you do that, that's you rejoicing in the Lord, your soul loving the Lord and, and, and thanking Him for what He's done. Okay, what are the three ways we can love the Lord of our soul? By praising Him, by boasting of Him, and by being joyful, you know, in Him, in His salvation. How can we love Him with our mind? All right, how can we love Him with our mind? Now, when I read to you before, Jesus was quoting from the book of Deuteronomy. So, what I'll get you to do is turn to the book of uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, I believe it is. I don't have it in my notes, but I believe it's chapter 6. I'll have to find it now. <clears throat> Just bear with me. Ah, uh, yeah. De Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Now notice this, I just thought this was interesting. This is exactly what Jesus quoted in the New Testament. Verse number four. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord with uh, thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. What did Jesus do in the New Testament? He added, with all thy mind. He actually added words to the Bible. Uh, he can do that. He's God. He's the author of the Word. He is the Word of God. All right? It's something that is never mentioned in the Old Testament in, in, that, uh, in that phrase, that we ought to love the Lord God with all our mind. Now, of course, you're going to find things in the Old Testament about loving God with our mind, but loving God with our mind is something that's really focused and emphasized in the New Testament in comparison to the Old Testament. Okay? And uh, just one example of that is... Um, if you guys can turn to Matthew 5, Matthew 5, verse 27. I'll just give you a quick example of this. Matthew chapter 5, verse 27. <clears throat> On the Sermon of the Mount, Jesus says, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. And that's right. That's in the Old Testament. That's in the Scriptures. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. One thing we notice about Jesus is that in the New Testament, he, he raises that bar even higher. Okay? It's not just the physical action, but it's also your thought life. It's what's going through your mind, or here, going through your heart. All right? And we, you, you'll see this shift when you get to the New Testament. There's a lot more focus on your mind. Okay, because it's not just the physical obeying the commands, but it's also keeping clean on the inside as well. All right. Now, I'll just quickly read to you from Romans 12, verse 2. It says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove that which is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, God has asked us that we need to keep renewing our mind. Continue thinking, hey, what are, we, what are we thinking about? You know, when you, when you were unsaved, you were watching all those TV shows, you were watching all those, reading all those books, which you shouldn't be reading. You know, you, you were flooding your mind with, with uh, you know, um, wrong philosophies in life, you know. And, and God says, you know, when you get saved, now you need to renew your mind. 
You need to take out those things that you've, you've learned all that time and, and get into the Word of God and, and make sure your mind is aligned with the Word of God. That's what it means to renew your mind. That's how we can love the Lord, is making sure that our mind is thinking about godly things. All right? That, it, that it's uh, tuned up with uh, how God thinks of things, how God sees evil, how God sees good, how God sees sin. Can you guys turn to 2 Corinthians verse 10? 2 Corinthians verse 10, chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. It reads, Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts of itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having in a, in a readiness to revenge all disobedience, when your disobedience is fulfilled. But you see how God instructs us to take captive every thought that we have in our minds. You know, when, when, you, when you start daydreaming, you're thinking about nonsense, God says, hey, that's a waste of your thought life. Take that into captivity and think of godly things. You know, you, you know the wild imaginations of man. Whatever it is that exalts itself before God, we need to take those down. And that's all the mental things that, that's inside of us. You know, how do we love the Lord with our mind? Is by renewing our mind, making sure that, we're, that we're, we're mentally focused on Him. We're focused on His Word. We're changing and aligning ourselves to think the way God thinks about certain things. And how can we love God with all our strength? That's very easy. You know, our strength is our, is our physical body, you know. What can we do with this body? Of course, we can go soul winning, we can go to church, we can uh, do good works to one another, all those kinds of things, you know. But I'll just read to you quickly from 1 Corinthians 6. Well, you guys can turn there because you're in 2 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18. But loving God with our strength, you know, it's loving God with our physical body, with the strength that God has given us in this physical body. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 18. It says, Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Hey, you know, we know this physical body is sin-cursed. We know this physical body has diseases and it's not going to last forever. You know, it's got a shelf life, it's got a, it's got a you know, use by date on it, you know. But while we have this body, okay, we are to, it, it, God calls it the temple, the temple of God. You know, he, he dwells in this physical body of ours, all right? And do you think God wants us then to look after our bodies or to destroy them? No, we should be looking after our bodies. You know, we should, you know, tr you know try, you know, I'll put in a bit of weight, I've got to try to work that off a bit, you know. The, the more weight I put on, it's going to put extra burden on other parts of my body, you know, on, on organs or whatever. We need, we need to, you know, be, be, be mindful of our health. You know, I'm not saying we should be extreme and that's all we should be concerned about and worried about, but we should be mindful about the kinds of things we eat, how we look after ourselves, the kind of chemicals that we put in our bodies. Because look, God has given us this body so we can work His works on this earth. You know, if you waste it, if you abuse it, if you destroy it, it's going to limit you from, you from loving God with all your strength, okay? You're going to be weak, and you won't be able to show, you know, your love to Him with all your strength, okay? So, I'm almost done now. So, how do you measure up by loving God, you know? You might say, well, I love God with all my heart. That's, well, you know, maybe 80% I love Him with all my heart, but with all my strength, really, I'm not doing much for the Lord in my body, Maybe that's somewhere around 10%, you know. And in my mind, I don't know, I, I spend a lot of time watching TV and a lot, lot of time, I haven't read my Bible in ages. You know, I guess I'm not loving him with my mind. That's probably somewhere at 20%, you know. And then you might say, well, you know, with, with, the, uh, with the heart or the soul, yeah, yeah, I come to church, I, I rejoice in the hymns that we sing, I lift up my voice, I sing at home. You know, that, that one's around 95%. You know, praise God, you know. But we need to make sure where do we fall short in those areas of our life? If we're falling short in our love toward God in some of those areas, well, target those areas first, the, the places that you're lacking in, and work toward that and love God with all those aspects, you know, with your heart, with your strength, with your mind, with your soul. 
in conclusion, guys, love your neighbors, love your brethren, love the Lord. Say, that's going to take a lot out of me. I don't know if I've got that much love. You know, you know what, what am I going to get out of this? And, you know, I'll just read to you Romans 8, 28, very famous passage. But let's think about what it says. It says, And we know that all things work together for good. To them that love God, to them that are called according to His purpose. Hey, if you want everything, even your, your hardships to work together for good, uh, there, is a, um, there is something you need to do. It says, to them that love God. All right, please, just because you're saved doesn't mean everything that, that happens in your life is going to necessarily work for good. You first have to love God, okay? It's, it's the fruit of the Spirit. It's the first one that's listed there. How do we love God? We love Him. We hate evil. We love our neighbors. We, lo- we love the brethren fervently. We love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, okay? And then when you go through the hardships of life, God promises that it's, all, it's going to work itself, work together for good in your life. There's a great promise. There's a great privilege in there, you know, but it comes, you've got to love God. All right, let's pray.